Okay, so we should now be live on YouTube. Welcome to anyone watching on YouTube. We are just going to bring folks in here on Zoom as well. All right, welcome folks. Heads up that we are live streaming, so we're gonna have just our panelists on video, but welcome, welcome. We are excited to dive in for today's panel. Just gonna take a moment to make sure the live stream is happening and that everyone is here on Zoom. And I think we're good. All right. So welcome everyone. Welcome to those of you on Zoom. Welcome to those of you watching on YouTube. This is our PhD panel with PhDs who have worked in government roles. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Tori Waber. I'm a PhD career and leadership coach and I'll be your host for today. The goal for today's panel is to learn more about where your PhD can take you in roles in and adjacent to government, right? You can use your PhD skills in a number of places outside of academia. And so my hope is that today you get more inspiration and optimism about places you can leverage your doctoral skills outside of the academy. So just so that we can get to know folks in attendance, can you please drop into chat what year of your PhD you're in? Or if you're post PhD, drop that. So go ahead and put in chat now your year of your PhD, or if you're post PhD, go ahead and jot that down in chat. First year, assistant professor. Post PhD, first year. Nice. Okay, we're getting a good variety here. Postdoc. Post PhD, third year. Nice. Okay, so panel, you can see folks that we have folks who are early in their PhD, folks who are post PhD, folks who are professors here, all of whom are curious to learn more from you as our panelists. Nice. And then attendees, one more question for you just to drop into chat. What's one question you have for today's panelists? So I'm gonna go ahead and solicit those, go ahead and put them in chat now. And I'll mention that because just the panelists are on video and audio, I'm going to do my best to source questions from the chat and read those. We may not be able to get to everyone's question because of the number of attendees, but I will do my best to answer the questions or ask the questions you have in chat and get them answered. There we go. How to find these jobs experience. Awesome. All right. So keep dropping those questions in chat. We're going to start off by introducing the panel. And then we'll go through a few questions I've prepared. We'll run through the questions that you guys have in chat. And then we're gonna be sure to wrap up at time because I know all of you panelists and attendees have busy Thursdays ahead. We'll also connect, uh, post ways to connect post panel in case you'd like to. One thing I'll mention before we dive in, our panelists are speaking on behalf of themselves, not on behalf of any organization. Okay, so let's get started with introductions. I'll introduce myself. For those of you who don't know me, oh, we're just gonna have panelists on video just since we're live streaming, if that's okay. Awesome. All right, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm Tori Waber, I'm a career and leadership coach. I got my PhD in human evolutionary biology at Harvard in 2012. I then worked in the tech industry for seven years at Facebook and Google, and now I run my own business as a career and leadership coach. I've helped more than 80 PhDs move into industry roles now, and I enjoy hosting these panels to give folks a sense of opportunity for what's possible with doctoral training. All right, time to introduce our panels. Aus Abdo completed his PhD in astrophysics, and he has experience working with the US Navy, DOD, DHS, NOAA, as well as with the government of Alberta, and probably some others that I missed there, Aus. <laughs> He's currently the CEO and founder of analyticadss.com. Welcome. Thank you. Glad to be uh, here. I'm glad to have you here. Uh, three quick questions so folks can get to know you. How many years post PhD are you? About 15 years. 15 years. Nice. Okay. So you've got a good 10 year post PhD to speak to. Out of curiosity, how many meetings do you have scheduled this week? This week, it's, I, I would say it's a light week. So maybe nine, 10 meetings. <laughs> 9-10 is a light week. Okay. Yes. <laughs> no. Unfortunately, I, I'm not a big fan of meetings, but you have to. We're getting a sense of your role here. We'll dive yeah. into that. And, and then key question, emojis in work emails, yay or nay? Big yeah. Yeah. Big yeah. fan of emojis. Yes. Right. All right. Set the <laughs> light, light is the mood, you know? 
<laughs> it does. It helps yeah, yeah. a little levity. Yes. Awesome. All right. Well, we're happy to have you as part of the panel. I was thank you for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Emmanuel Larbi Olfay is currently working on his PhD in economics. He has experience working at the National Communications Authority in Ghana. Welcome, Emmanuel. Hi, thank you very much. I'm privileged to be here. Yes, happy to have you here. So, Emmanuel, we were talking about this. At what point of your PhD are you now? I'm in the second year. Nice, exciting. And I'm curious, roughly how many statistical tests have you used so far this year? Um, I've lost count, but let's say 10 to 15. <laughs> 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 Several, some number. Uh, Critical question here. Socks with sandals. Yay or nay? Big nay. The weather in my home country, Ghana, is warm. So, and we wear sandals often, but without socks. Yeah, no, okay, no socks with the sandals. Good. So I saw the other panelists saying no as well. So we're we're unified on the no socks with sandals front. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you for joining, Manuel. Excited to jump into your experience in a moment. Okay, and Stephen Astelos completed his PhD in nuclear physics. He has experience working at Lawrence Berkeley Lab and Livermore Labs. He's currently a career counselor at Ohlone College and founder of academicallyspeaking.com. Welcome, Stephen. Well, thank you very much, Tori. Great Stephen, to be here. Yeah, happy to have you here. How many years post-PhD are you? Uh, well, let's see. I, I could use the unit millennium, but uh, it's been a full 25 years, I think, since getting out of Berkeley. There you go. Getting out of Berkeley. Interesting. Well, no, yeah, I won't read into that, but yeah, 25 years. Okay, nice. Stephen, roughly how many emails are in your inbox right now? Well, I have, I think I have about seven inboxes and there's probably over a hundred thousand uh, various uh, read and unread emails. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay. Seven inboxes. I didn't even think to ask about seven inboxes. Wonderful. And then key question here, pineapple on pizza, yay or nay? Those are fighting words. <laughs> Which side are you on? No. <laughs> no. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm on the same page there. But yes, mm -hmm. if anyone wants to fight us, wants to virtually arm wrestle about pineapple, <laughs> we can do that later on in the panel. Well, welcome, Stephen. Excited to have you here. All right. So we're going to dive in with a few starter questions here. And then I'm going to look into the chat and start to ask questions that folks have asked there. I think the first thing I like to ask folks is just to share a little bit about journey out of academia. So remembering back to your PhD and thinking about where you went afterwards, can you maybe speak a little to, a bit to what that looked like? I can, take right. it. I, I can take it. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm yeah, yes. Sure. So, so I think, you know, um, uh, for me, I graduated from with a PhD from Michigan State back in 2006, 2007. Uh, it was a, um, I got a postdoc at uh, the Nineveh Research Lab funded by NASA at the time. And um, really the motivation came from feeling um, somewhat underappreciated and underpaid. Those were sort of the main motivations, to be honest. Um, as a postdoc, and later I became a professor at George Mason University in Virginia, it, you know, doing... 60 to 80 hour weeks were normal. Uh, you were expected to, you know, eight hour days are, are nearly not the norm. So 15, 16 hour days, even the weekends were, were expected. And I was newly married at the time. So I didn't feel that was fair. Uh, of course, being underpaid is a different, you know, another, another um, issue. So that motivated me to uh, start looking and uh, uh, into, you know, at the time, you know, quant, becoming a quant and Wall Street and so forth. Uh, it took me a while to really figure out, uh, you know, what to do. Uh, and then I think by 2012, I think 2011 is when I left academia uh, and um, uh, joined the, you know, the industry and then later the government. So um, it can be a tedious process to actually try to leave. Uh, it can be overwhelming. Uh, some people like myself included didn't know where to start. So I think some guidance um, could benefit a lot uh, for those who are trying to leave academia. Oh, is any regrets now that you're on the other side? Um, I still miss the science. I mean, you know, at the time people would ask me, why would you do this? You know, why, 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 why were you a scientist? And I, I, you know, I, my daily routine as a scientist was hunting back and hunting down black holes, neutron stars and active galactic nuclei. So extremely interesting work. I mean, I loved it, you know, 
but the 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 politics the you know overworking um it it was too much uh, I, I i do miss the science you know if as sometime you know in the future i actually can go back and and do the science i would love to especially like you know the the you know the nasa telescopes i was working on fermi and swift and others the data the data is open to the public so if if in the future i have time i would actually go back and and do the science so i, I do miss the science that's it Yeah, I'll follow up. Uh, thanks, Aus. Uh, I think that, you know, it's helpful to think of, um, you know, the journey is like not a permanent journey away from academia, because you can weave, you know, I, I'm not saying anything new right now, but it's, it's, it's um, very possible, and I've done it to weave myself in and out of academia, as, um, you know, time and money see fit, you know, so I went from um, a postdoc to a position at a national lab, to private industry to back to academia i'm actually a, you know for 14 years been a professor at at cal state east bay in uh in the bay area here um but i only do it part-time because i want to do other things with my life so you know i think these are touchstones that we can revisit depending on what other uh factors and pressures we are experiencing in our life and i think that flexibility is really helpful because you know of the nature of the job market these days yeah, for me, I don't have that long spell outside academia, like my seniors would have said. Mine was more serendipitous, like I might say, more accidental. It just happened that my after my master's, I happened to be working in academia, both as a in a research organization at the University of Ghana. So we're doing more of household service research and then research assistant and teaching. But then it was on contract. And when my contract ended, then the regulator, the National Communications Authority, was setting up a research division. So the head of the department came to my institute and said, can you recommend somebody who can help with a background in economics and statistics to help fit in our division? And then I was fortunate to be recommended. I had no idea what this organization was about and what they do, so I had to go and read about it. And then I found myself there for the past six years. Uh, that was where my life ended. until. I still found out that I needed to be in academia to hone my skills. Then I came back. So just as Stephen is saying, it's not a dead end. It's not like I'm fully out of academia. I, I love to be at the intersection because when I worked there in the government, I realized that there is so much disconnect between academia and industry because we don't understand each other so well. And I feel like at a point in time, I want to be at the intersection. So I am not fully out yet. One leg is in academia, and then the other leg is still in industry. Well, and it's awesome to hear this perspective of, you know, so often if we're on the faculty path, we figure we're either on that or off that, and it draws this dichotomy. But what I'm hearing from panelists is really that sort of weaving through, finding opportunities that work with what you need for resources, what you need for skills, where you want to contribute over time and continuing to adjust that with time. That's what I'm hearing. Does that resonate with folks on the panel? Am I capturing that well? Yes, indeed. Yeah, for me, it's yes. Yes, indeed. And so, Emmanuel, you mentioned this, but I'm going to ask about this because it's come up in the chat. You know, experiences to become a competitive applicant for these types of jobs. So it may be that actually the work you're doing in your training sets you up for them. For folks to be able to find a government position, what should they be thinking about to make themselves a competitive applicant? Yeah, stakeholder management is one key thing you need to learn. And then communication and then building networks. In my particular case, as a regulator, we were dealing with mobile telecom operators. These are very powerful. And John people have the money, they can hire the best of staff and personnel. And then sometimes when you come out with policies or regulation, they can challenge you in the law courts. You need to mount up evidence. You need to, you are competing with the best of the best in the industry. And so you need to have the confidence when you are sitting in meetings with them, you are the regulator. What policies, what laws are you putting out there? But they are also challenging you because they understand the industry. They've hired the experts and you are talking to them. But then you should also be able to learn. When you make mistakes, you should be able to admit that, okay, thank for this, we'll go back to the drawing board and then come back to you again on this. 
and your ability to communicate with people behind the scenes. So after this heated official engagement, behind the scenes, you sit and said, okay, that was a good one. Now tell us more about it. We don't have this information that you are sharing with us. Can we learn more about that? Then we go back to our boardroom and then learn, okay, it seems we got this one wrong. And then these people have more information than we do. What do we do? So we learn from them. So that was very key. Again, the networking. So I got recommended because I was open. I shared ideas. And I also was able to communicate clearly the things I want to do, my aspirations. So it's not all about you, but it's about the people that is around you that can mention your name to somebody somewhere, even in your absence. And that is very key. That's what I've found so far. So try and build a lot of bridges as much as possible wherever you find yourself. Yeah, that would be my initial thought. Yeah. yeah, I really like that, you know, you, my postdoc advisor used to say, like, it doesn't matter if you're looking for a faculty job, it doesn't matter whether people like you or dislike or hate you. It's just that your name is known. And, um, and he was a very wise individual. But, um, you know, speaking to my direct experience at the national labs in the United States, um, one of the labs I worked with is ultra competitive and, and getting a position there is harder than um, you know, faculty position at many, you know, R1 uh, universities. So they're just, you know, it's top-notch academics that will get you in. But of course, knowing people still helps. And then at the other lab at Livermore, it's much larger. It's 6,000. It was 8,000 people when I was there. And they're getting the entry, the barrier to entrance is much lower. They advertise, they have hundreds of jobs open at any given time. Uh, again, networking helps, but I think the barrier is lower. And, you know, it's a it's a, um, yeah, just a lower barrier job with um, a little bit more unpredictability because you don't really know what you'll wind up doing in the long term at these labs that are focused on um, weapons and weapons related, uh, you know, Department of Defense concerns. Well, and so I'm curious, you know, at least in the in the Twitterverse, where maybe I spend too much time these days, networking is sometimes construed as a dirty word, or people are nervous about it, or they're not sure how to approach it. Anything that you can mention, we've heard a couple of things, right, of making sure your name gets spoken about, maybe building those connections. But for folks who might be nervous about networking or not sure how to approach it, anything you can share about how you've invested in your network throughout your career? Aus, would you like to take that one? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, in, in terms of uh, leaving academia, right? Uh, yes, um, I, I think networking is probably, uh, from what I saw at least, most of the people I know who left academia and, and got jobs in the industry or you know, outside academia, um, it happened almost always with a connection on the inside. So for me, when I left um, NASA back in 2011, 2012, um, I, you know, somebody who had already left academia, we work on the same experiment at uh, Los Angeles National Lab, and he worked at the uh, Institute for Defense Analysis, which is uh, an FFRDC, Federally Funded Research and Development Center. It's sort of like a national lab, really, but uh, it's it's sort of like a semi-private. And, um, you know, you need connections. You need someone on the inside uh, to, to sort of, you know, get you the opportunity. The problem I see, you know, for, for academic, academics who are trying to bridge the gap and move into, you know, outside of academia is I feel there's always some kind of disconnect. Uh, we're very, very specialized in what we do as PhDs, either through, you know, when we're doing our PhD or as postdocs or even as a professors, we're very, you know, we concentrate too many too much on on, on uh, maybe results and um, we don't really look at the big picture in, in industry and in the government you need to sort of speak their lingo you need to 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 uh show how you you know they can benefit the institution or the, the company or the government how how can they benefit from you and more often than not you're you're usually more you know more qualified than they really need to and you need to show them what you could do uh, to help them uh, if they were to hire you. Uh, and, and I should say that there are a lot of respect in, in, in over the past 15 years since I got my PhD. There's a lot of respect for people with PhDs, especially especially in the private sector. Um, so being a doctor, you know, a PhD has, has its own weight, honestly. Um, I, I could see it 
do you know at least 10 percent increase salaries just because you have a phd so uh don't you know uh, under yourself yourself be be confident and uh with the skills you have it's it's uh you know industries and governments are, are always welcoming yeah i would also want to add exactly to what i was just said sometimes you have few that has been overqualified it is up to you to portray yourself as either a unifier or you fit into the system. Again, as he said, we come in with straightforward jacket. I mean, this is how things are done. There's a method, this and this. This language, that's why I said earlier that the gap between academia and industries can sometimes be wide. Because you go and make the presentation and nobody understood what you said. And you tell you this is too academic. I mean, it's too academic. Nobody, what they are doing there has nothing to do with some of those rigorous methodology, other things. It's just a simple thing. So in simple terms, what does it mean? At the end yes. of the day, what are you saying? Can you say it in a very plain, simple language? So there is always a yardstick. Can a five-year-old, 15-year-old, 16-year-old understand what you are saying? Because in this stakeholder engagement or this, there are a wide spectrum of people from different backgrounds. They are not in your economics PhD module with you or your chemistry or science lab with you. So they don't understand exactly what you are saying. It is up to you to communicate clearly. So we need to, some of these platforms helps you to understand how to even communicate to non-technical audience. And the more you begin to build on that, you realize that gradually you get that appeal and people want to listen to you when you are making a submission because you are able to clearly communicate and connect. So we should be able to have interests beyond the narrow field of PhD because it's more specialized and it's more vertical than it's horizontal. And you need to invest more resources to be able to branch off and dilute and make sure that you're able to create this connection. And that has to be done by you yourself because your coursework or research will not provide those avenues for you. So that is the exact thing I want to add to it. I, I agree. And I... And I uh... I, I want to say this in a, in a way that is not politically incorrect. Uh, I have had so many meetings with C-level executives from, you know, Fortune 500 and Fortune 100 companies and executive in the government. And uh, uh, you have to, as PhDs, we, 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 we tend to sort of complicate things, you know, try not to use equations, trying to, to use uh, basic, uh, you know, nomenclature uh, words. Uh, they really are looking at the bottom line. You know, if if you can describe something, uh, uh, you know, uh, tune down an analysis or a machine learning algorithm that you built, or a predictive model that this this and that, if you can tune it down to uh, you know 15, 16, 17 year old level, uh, uh, it will be really beneficial. Because the more the, the more complicated you, you you make it sound, the less likely they are gonna buy into it. Well, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jargon pause for a moment, remembering back to PhDs. Buy-in and stakeholder. Let's unpack those for the folks who are listening. What's buy-in, Aus? Buy-in, um, basically trying to, so, so you, you know, I'm assuming that you, you got a job at a company, let's say, uh, and uh, you have, uh, you know, uh, like, you know, I'm going to give an example. I was working for a, a second largest commercial estate company in the world, Jones Lang LaSalle, a really, really cool company to work for. And uh, I was working, I was part of the global innovation team. And we had lots of funding. Uh, unlike the government, they are very open to spending money on, you know, experiments, basically. And they wanted to, they brought in a team and they wanted to see what can data science and AI and all the you know cool things back in 2013, 2014 do to them, do for them. And um, we had to get a, a blessing from a C-level executive, you know, uh, CTO or CIO at the time. Uh, so to buy in is basically to convince them that, listen, I'm going to take you on a venture. I'm going to use data that you either have or you know, I'm going to acquire data from outside. It's going to cost money. We're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars a year uh, to run in an experiment. And maybe the outcome will be this. And the outcome, if it happens, then you spend, you know, maybe three, four hundred thousand dollars. But you're, you know, beneficial, you know, the, 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 the profit, potential profit is such and such in millions. So you have to, you know, convince them that this might happen. 
uh, and you know, if you just show some statistics and tables and graphs, that might actually deter them. So you have to speak their language. You have to uh, go up to their level, really, in terms of thinking. Well, and, and you're undercutting how tough it is to get exec buy-in, probably because you've been doing it for years. But <laughs> right. Yeah, I, 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 initially it was tough, but then I, you know, when I once understood, the, you know, what it takes really to to to. Uh, you have to think the way they think, you know, the C-levels, the executives in the government um, and so forth. I mean, for, for academics, you know, uh, we were used to submitting proposals, right? We call for proposals, ask for money and so forth. It's it's a different mentality. The other receiving end, you know, either it be NIH or NASA or so forth, they are all PhDs, they're all the same level, they think the same way. You have to impress them. You have to 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 be you know sound complicated and 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 confident when it comes to the you know technical part. Here it's different. Here they are businessmen, here they are executives in the government who you need to you know basically show them value. Yeah, and similar to the example that you cited, I remember. I had joined this uh, regulator and I wanted to convince them that we need to do a nationwide ICT survey because we regulate the ICT sector. We need to make data-driven decisions. And then the point is, okay, is that our core mandate? Our core mandate is to issue licenses and then issue sanctions, make sure that QoS have been quality of service consumers. That is what we do. My head of department says, okay, the board of directors, the sealed level executive, that's a final decision makers, you would have to go and make a presentation to convince them. Not, I'm not a director, I'm not a head. But I said, okay, you understand this very well because they may ask questions. We get there and this presentation is supposed to take like 30 minutes or more minimum. We get there and they said, okay, we don't have time. You have five minutes. Can you tell us exactly what it's about and why we should pump money to do this? That is not our work. I mean, we are not <laughs> a research organization. We are not, so what do we do? So I have to now, on my feet, con convey everything I've done, PowerPoint presentation in five minutes, because that is all the time you have. But then because I have gone through this over time, and that's why I began by saying stakeholder management, every stakeholder and what you're supposed to prepare, tailor me information for them. And I was able to break down this very difficult processes and requirement and justification within a short time. And then at a point in time, they said, okay, we'll give you five more minutes because then I realized that they become more interested in what I'm saying because I was able to, my, my initial statement has been able to capture everything that they needed. Eventually to cut the story short, they approved the project. That was a maiden survey we did with other stakeholders. Then eventually I had to go to Switzerland to go and present this at the UN ICT specialized agency to tell them. And then they were like, okay, this is a very good approach to use. Other countries can follow same. So it goes back to we making sure as PhDs, we have everything we take. We understand the processes, we have the skills, we have the expertise. And then how do we transform these skills depending on the need that we have to be able to not always monetize it, but just to sell ourselves and then sell the knowledge to other people. And then afterwards, they begin to believe in your capabilities and assign you more work and know that when they entrust a lot of difficult things even in your hands, you can be able to deliver. And that first foot in the door approach that you are able to create a good name or a good image can open greater doors for you moving forward where your name will be mentioned at places and said, oh, this person can handle this. Maybe get this guy on, on board because the other time this was difficult, he was able to manage it. So that's what I want to come. Thanks. Yeah. yeah, let me just tie those uh, thoughts together. I, I love what both of you said. Uh, you know, in my there are two kind of clients in the government. The one, the technical clients, where you're going to go in and do basically what you did as a postdoc or as a graduate student, like at Lawrence Livermore Labs or NASA. And then there are the DHS and other bodies. My role at Livermore, we'd often have to go pitch our ideas in to the DHS. So while as a research science in a national lab, my client, then that's where I had to bring, you know, bring, you know, they were, I had to bring my deliverables down to package it, not necessarily at an eighth grade level or something, but, you know, not at a PhD level, because there would be scientists that would review my project, but also the, you know, fund people that heard the, uh, held the purse strings and the people that, you know, looked at it from a pol completely political perspective. So, and that was very interesting and also very vexing. 
Well, and I'll just speak to, you know, where in academics, the, the funding is often writing grants. These sort of looking for funding in these sort of roles that you're speaking to are these meetings. And so learning how to manage them and how to request funding, potentially in 30 minutes, you could get as much as a, you know, a 30 page grant if you're able to deliver well. Can I so, also um, add yeah, that ahead, yeah. if you are the PhD who are transitioned into government rules, at some point you would have to be the expert in there to break down these things to them. So you are going to meet these professors, these consultants, these experts, these technical people. They are bringing a technical proposal. And it is your responsibility to read these proposals, understand them. So we, as a government regulator, we deal with a lot of, I mean, the elite consultants you can think in the telecoms industry in Europe, in America, we deal with them. And then when there is a project, they bid, they bring their proposal, technical proposals and other things. You are reviewing this because the assumption is you understand it. And then you meet these proposals, and you meet these consultants in the meeting to give feedback on the work that they have done. So it is both sides. One side, you are trying to break it down to the other people. The other side, you are doing the difficult technical things because they have brought together a work. Maybe there are three different proposals that has received from three consultants, and you are supposed to evaluate this bit and give written comment why you selected this over that or that. So it also brings to bear your knowledge or your understanding of the, the field or the industry. So it both sides. And I, I just thought I should make it aware for those who are thinking of transitioning so that they know that this is how difficult it can also be at times. Yeah, thanks. All right, and it's wonderful to be able to capture that for folks, to be both the expert in your discipline and be able to translate that broadly. So there's one question I want to make sure we get to. It's not in the chat, but it's something I want to make sure we speak to, which is choosing to work in government or in government adjacent, as opposed to maybe the private sector or academia, right? So thinking about that choice of going towards one of these government roles. I know, Stephen, you were mentioning that the lab you went to was tougher than getting a tenure track position. What was the motivator there to go work in that lab in particular? Well, um, I just want to clarify, I worked in that lab as a graduate student, you know, as when I was at Berkeley, the national lab is right behind the campus. Um, but I did, you know, but I was there long enough and a, and, a, and a guest there for the next 20 years to get a good feel for the internals of that lab, but I never was paid there except as a graduate student. Um, but I can speak to it a bit. Uh, but at Livermore, it was a you know, very different place. They're also competitive, but not at that same level. Alice, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think I should uh, I should add that um, when, when we, we speak about government, uh, you know, we're talking about the federal government, and it it's it's a spectrum. It's not really the, all the same. You know, when we work at NASA or National Lab, um, you're expected to work at the cutting edge of science and technology. Uh, so it's totally different than working at say um, you know Homeland Security or DoD. Um, the expectation are expectations are totally different. Um, so when you're a national lab, you're basically a scientist. So it's a continuation of academic life. It's a continuation. Yeah. If you as a scientist, uh, your concentration is publication, accuracy, uh, discoveries, et cetera. When you work at DOD or DHS, uh, you know, or, or, or you know, um, intelligence agencies, it's totally different, you know, uh, goal, totally different set of tasks. Uh, the, the the way of thinking is different. So it's kind of a, 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 different, a different spectrum when we talk about the government. Yeah, you, you like you, another way of looking at that is you're just wearing different hats all the time in the, in that job. Yes. Definitely. Yeah, you, you, you know, one day you'll show up as a scientist and the next day you'll show up as, you know, these, these are our customers and I need to sell them on my ideas or my, you know, my proposal. Mm -hmm. Correct, correct. And so I'm curious because I'm less knowledgeable. So my sense is that in those national labs, you're wearing your scientist hat. If you're in those DHS or those intelligence or those sort of roles, is it funding for a research program? Is it influencing decisions? What's the sort of hat you would be wearing in those spaces? So, so at, you know, at DHS currently, we're, we work with national labs, mostly, I think, INL, uh, Idaho National Lab. Uh, so the government puts out, you know, like DHS projects, right, that are biddable for like, you know, five or six years projects. So, you know, my company has a subcontract 
to work on one of these projects alongside with INL and others. Um, so like our role as, as my company with DHS uh, is, is basically developing, you know, predictive models and, you know, AI and machine learning algorithms, data analytics and so forth. The, the, the national labs, you know, we work with them, but um, they do more of the science behind it. So you're providing a service that allows this bigger umbrella project to get done because of the expertise that you and your group are bringing. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. Nice. Okay. And the other thing to call out there that I'll just make clear for folks, you know, we talk about working for the government. You might be employed, say, by the federal government, or you might be doing something related to the government, but on a contract where you're in an independent company. I, I found it really uh, hard to actually get uh, like a federal government job, to be a Fed. I remember applying since 2008 for federal government jobs at whatever the US, USAjobs.gov or something, I can't remember. And I actually log in from what we once in a while and jobs are still pending that applied to 15 or 16 years ago. So getting a federal government US job, I've never seen it done until unless you actually worked with them and then they would you know sort of hire you. Um, it's uh, it's very challenging to to actually get the government job, so that's why you know I, I actually at some point established my own company and found it easier to get to contracts from or subcontracts from the government. Yeah, I'll, I'll second that. Um, I applied to for you know, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, you know, back around the time I graduated, and and I, I st never still haven't heard anything from them. Um, but the at the same time, you know, the government labs have their own hiring, you know, employment agencies on site. So I think the barrier there is much more, or the, you know, it's much more direct employment. But if you go through USA Gov and that's your only recourse, best of luck to you. Yeah, I, it's it's going to take years, uh, unless if you know somebody on, somebody on the inside or as you know, if they tailor the job to you. Yeah, it's it's same here. Getting a government job is extremely difficult. I got in before I realized, oh, it's that difficult to get in. So I asked myself, how did I get in? That's why I began by saying <laughs> I got in purely by accident. But then also that is one of the greatest insurance you can have. Government job is more like guaranteed. You barely be laid off unless you want to leave. So it's good. And then it gives you, unlike private company that focus on a particular thing, when you are in government, it's a wide array of things you do. And it's a very good learning field for you because the government is focusing on different things. As you said, there's a change of government, change of direction, you know, things. You think like a politician at one point, you think like a business person at the other point, you think like all this kind of, you wear different hats at different times. So it's one of the best places um, you can work. And then also job security until probably you go on retirement or something. So yeah, if it becomes your way, go for it. Is it okay if we, I answer one of the questions in the uh, yes, chat? Yes, please, go for it. I think uh, Tamar has asked, uh, could you define buy-in? I think this is in relation to what you asked earlier in the government. Um, so, so in the government, um, you know, once you, you basically, uh, you know, uh, be a part of a bid. And um, if the government was to leave everything to the big, you know, dogs, basically, you know, Lockheed Martin and, uh, you know, Ayers and Young and so forth, uh, you know, small companies like mine and uh, the asset partners, which I, uh, you know, collaborate with all the time, uh, we will not be able to get anything. So they they sort of have a small chunk from almost every uh, um, um, CFP that would go to smaller companies. And, uh, you know, we submit a, you know, a proposal and to buy in is basically to convince the government that although you are not a multi-billion dollar company, you can actually uh, do more, uh, service them more, uh, given your expertise. Uh, and, and it really is, is getting in the door in, in a given government uh, entity like DHS, uh, you know, or, or NOAA or NASA. And once they, they see the value that you bring to the table, they start inviting you to uh, other projects. And we have seen that happen. Like we started working with DHS back in 2018 and almost every project after that with DHS has been direct invite uh, because they see the value that we, we bring to the table. And so I'm yeah, let, also, a... let me also oh, no, add that anyway. it happens because sometimes there's costs involved in searching for new clients and other things. So, 
depends on the agency of the work instead of going through the entire process again, if these are already in your database. And that is why the opportunity you get, you must deliver and deliver well so that you are in the good books. As we said, the recommendation, the name calling, other things are very good. And it happens that at short notice, then you can rely on those who are already in the system and then find out if they are available and capable of handling it, then you go through that process. And so I'll echo what I'm hearing because I think this is under the service, but you're almost not giving yourself credit for it. And each of you speaking about this, knowing folks who are adjacent to the type of work you want to do, or maybe in it, understanding what it is they need, understanding how your experience can help meet their need, and then positioning your experience as meeting their need compellingly, then maybe delivering and delivering again. Is that fair? Excellent. Have I captured that? Yes. Yep. yes. Excellent. Excellent description. Yes, indeed. And I would put that for any role, actually, like government or non-government. The better you can understand who you're speaking to, what they need, how to speak to them, win-win. Tactical question here from the chat that I'll just all voice. Do you need to have citizenship from the country of the government you want to work for? Um, I th in the U.S. government, I think, yeah, you have to. You have to. Yeah, I, I, I'm not aware of an exception. Um, certainly for the DOD labs, there's, you know, very high security clearances. Yes. Yeah. If you, if you wanted to go DOD, DHS, uh, intelligence agencies route, then you definitely have a, to have a, a, you know, high level security clearance, which take years to get. If you don't want to do that and you want to, uh, if you're not a US citizen, you, you, you can sometimes work as a, as a contractor in very limited capacity for some like national labs and and uh, some other government entities, but to to be a to to be a federal U.S. government employee, hundred percent, you have to be a citizen. Mm -hmm. Nice, good tactical address there. Any conferences folks would recommend to start to build this network or knowledge of opportunities? So my favorite uh, conference is the Open Data Science Conference (ODSC). There, there are two, one in the East Coast and one in the West Coast. I go to both of them every year. Um, that's how I actually started networking uh, back in 2012. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of R. You know, I use Python a lot in academia, but now I, we use R a lot. So, you know, uh, R conferences, RCDConf, uh, which, you know, I think is coming up. Um, I think conferences is, is, is a great way to actually network. And to learn about uh, what uh, yeah, the industry, you know, what people industry and the industry are doing, and so forth. In in Tori, are you referring to um, government jobs here, or? Yep. Yeah. Just question in the chat of conferences that you folks would recommend to be able to find pathways in. Yeah. So you know, like the AP, the American Physical Society, the American Astronomical Society, Society. A lot of times, not only are scientists there, but um, Funding agencies make, you know, broad appearances there. And it's a good, once you get to know the ropes a little bit, you can hit those people up and just talk to them and tell them where you're at and, you know, have a one-on-one -on -one because they're otherwise, it's impenetrable to ever get their attention, you know, difficult to get their attention. I think there's a, a question I would like to answer from Kathleen. So what are application strategies besides USAJobs.gov? If you if you were, you know, if, if you're talking about the, you know, federal government jobs or, you know, government jobs, um, then probably uh, your best bet is to communicate to, you know, contracting companies that, uh, companies that work, do work for the government. Uh, I would start with the big names, you know, Lockheed Martin, um, Ernst & Young and others. Um, who do consulting work for the government. Um, they are always hiring um, and they are easier to find than smaller companies. Uh, but that that is one, one way to do it. Um, yeah, and we mentioned earlier how you can go directly to the individual institutions' websites. But I also want to add something I did a few years ago. The government like, makes SBIR grant awards in a variety of fields, and I would go down the list of people that were awarded money and reach out to them and see if they had any openings. And, the, and not only was I increasing my network by doing so, but these are folks that are flush with money and presumably hiring. And those, those lists are always available on the SBIR's uh, website, and it's very, very helpful. So the grants are sometimes just 100000 but the largest ones are over a million dollars.
And so I see a few questions in the chat here that I'm going to combine. You know, what about folks who have, say, a life sciences, social sciences, or humanities background? And your experience with these various organizations, where might their skills be able to fit? I, I can only personally speak to uh, what I'm familiar with, which is, you know, ap applying your skills in the data science slash AI ML space. So a lot, I've, I've seen a lot of people from, from that, you know, uh, uh, life sciences who did bi biology and other, you know, fields. Uh, they have excellent background in statistics and programming, and they were able to, uh, you know, actually contribute even building, you know, software packages in R and Python that I actually use daily uh, from people who actually are were in, in the life sciences. So it doesn't have to be exactly like, you know, physics or mathematics or engineering background, but really uh, if you want to bridge the gap and move into data science slash AI slash ML roles, then you need to have the, uh, you already have as a PhD, the problem solving in skill, which is, you know, very necessary. Uh, but you need to, uh, uh, you know, uh, if you don't have the uh, programming, uh, and coding background, and that's something you 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 need to build. Yes, yeah, so I would also want to add up to that. I said earlier that I moved from academia and then worked in this National Communications Authority to regulate the telecoms industry. I am an economist. My background is in economics. So all this while I was looking into something like financial organizations, the central bank, or you no, know, that the legacy places that the skills of an economist will be needed. I had no idea I was going to land in the telecoms regulatory space. Then I guess that I realized there is enough space for me to operate. And I have had to introduce a lot of innovative ideas, not because I am an economist, but because I have expertise as a graduate student or as a researcher who understand how to leverage on data to make decisions. Because telecoms is a more specialized field for engineers, other things. And I find myself there. So I have to interact with these engineers, first understand their language, and then explain to them why every decision they take is not an engineering decision, but it also has economic implication because you're dealing with resources like spectrum that you need to, I mean, allocate this spectrum or auction them, or it is not just technical, it's also an economic decision. So I felt where we can apply our skills or expertise. Sometimes, as I said earlier, we seem to narrow ourselves too much, either through the default of how the training is structured at the PhD level or the pressure on us to finish our PhD so we don't open up to other opportunities. Once you have that skills to be able to analyze complex things, to be able to decipher things, to be able to write things clearly, I mean, these are generic skills that are applicable in several rules that you may not even be aware of. And technology is bridging a lot of gaps. You can even go to different industry, you can even change jobs entirely and begin something entirely new. You may be a scientist, but then the job you enter into has nothing to do with science per se. But then you are using something totally different where you occasionally apply your science knowledge. So if we open up as PhD or graduate student, I think we'll have more opportunities to explore other than just keeping our mind narrow on, I'm a science student, I'm an economic student, so I'm only interested in economic things or science things. Yeah. Well, and I'll build on that point, Emmanuel. One of the things I see folks have the most difficulty with is to let go of their topic, their PhD topic. So maybe just show of hands panel, how many of you are using your PhD topic in work that you're doing outside of academia? None, right? So skills, yes, right? Your problem solving, your communication, all that stuff, yes. But your exact topic may be something that you have to be flexible on as you look further afield. Fair? Am I off base there? No, you're not. Nope, I think right on track. Yeah, I think mentioning the topic you worked on most of the time it's an exotic topic to people in, in the outside of academia so mentioning it actually might get you you know points uh in a meeting or or something i mean you know sometimes when i introduce myself i you know i worked on pulsars and hunting down bus or pulsars and black holes and neutron stars like oh, wow you know so a lot of us have have you know are working on the cutting edge of science and and that's actually very appealing to people outside of academia so it is actually a plus to mention it but you need to let go of it at some point. 
And may I add for those folks that, you know, have uh, humanities PhDs, there is a parallel discussion that would be very similar to this one, but I think the three panelists that you have in front of you don't have particular expertise in that area, so we would just be not making it up, but I, I know there is a parallel universe in which all this applies to the, you know, to the humanities, and I'm just not qualified to talk about it. And what I'll suggest there for folks in attendance who may want to think about that is go to folks who have a profile that looks interesting, ask them for information. Don't ask them for a job. Don't go and say, your job is amazing. Get me a job. But if you go and you say, hey, could you, you know, give me 30 minutes to tell me a little bit about your path and how you got there? Many folks will make time for that, right? And so there's room to gather information. If you see someone who has a path similar to yours, if you see them on one of these panels, stellar because they've already made the time. But please, you know, go ask folks for time. Don't ask random folks for jobs. It doesn't work. Yes. Or uh, may, maybe if you're using Steven's strategy of looking up the folks who are well-funded and you're putting your skills out, maybe there's a click, but it tends to be low conversion. <laughs> Iman, you'll go ahead. Yeah, that's true because you have to pick your conversation in a structured way, maybe in more build them in chunks. Things that will not put the person off at the start and want to ignore your emails or calls at the thing. So build upon it gradually something that will remain in the person's mind and then you know the end game then gradually you are, what are you bringing on board is that something a person is doing you are interested oh i saw this work you're doing it's very interesting i think i've suggested i mean then you create that image in a person's mind and occasionally find out what i can meet for lunch just talk about something or send an email generally then as you begin to build that network then one day you can pop up and say okay um is it possible that you do this or do that? Then you take it out from there. That would be a strategy I would suggest. Not to go just straight away from bombarding people with a lot of things. I mean, they want to ignore you right from the way it go. Thanks. I, I think one thing uh, that um, would help actually uh, moving outside of academia is building your online presence. Um, so, you know, people don't really care if you published in nature or science. They they just don't. Uh, uh, you might have worked for a couple of years to publish an out, you know, uh, a breakthrough on in nature or science, but they wouldn't care about that. They would care about a simple project that you built and put as an open source on GitHub or, you know, shared it on Medium or, or or LinkedIn. They do care about these things, especially especially your projects on GitHub. So I would I would advise that you build your online presence and at GitHub build the uh, you know software products, uh, projects. Uh, be active on, on LinkedIn and, and Twitter. This is how you get noticed. Uh, I actually hired a couple of guys uh, from Europe that left academia, and uh, I ended up just you know over the years looking for some software, and I found that they have shared it on, on GitHub and uh, was open source. I ended up actually hiring them, mm -hmm. and I actually reached out to them and I, I asked them, please come work for me. Um, so um, you have to build your online presence definitely. And there are so many projects that you, you, people can work on. Um, uh, open data sets that people can just imagine, I don't know, something related to um, the weather, global warming, um, mm -hmm. something that interests you and, and look up the data set. There are so many, there are millions of open data sets and pick up Python or R or whatever your language, the preference, preferred language and start uh, building you know, uh, an analysis and maybe even build a software product, put it in GitHub, uh, advertise it in, in LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, that, that will get you, that's probably one of the easiest ways to get you out of academia. Mm -hmm. Yes, and to add to that, we should be intentional about what we want to get from the use of social media or the online presence, as you said. I mean, what we put out there, because that footprint is going to be there. It can work for you or against you. So as people who look forward to getting something from, we need, we need to be intentional. When I go there, what am I looking for? What are the key things? Because it can also be a time-wasting adventure for you. You just go there, spend, and you are buried in so many things. So that's what I want. Whilst you build your online presence, make sure that you are intentional about what you want to drive at or what you want to do on that online presence. And I'm going to add a layer to that and see what, if it sticks with you folks on the panel, which is doing that, but doing that in a, a genuine like to rather than have to. If you go out and you start building the like, oh, I have to create a GitHub presence because someone said I have to because I have to do this to get a job. 
it's a different motivation than I genuinely enjoy this, right? Like I'm building stuff in R and it's fun and I'm just going to share it because I like it. And so coming from a place of genuine, a genuine interest, same with a relationship, right? If you're building a relationship and you're like, I'm just building this to get an end, folks can feel that. But if you're like, no, I genuinely think your work is interesting. I'm going to reach out because I think this is interesting. That has a different vibe. So genuine interest and genuine enjoyment go a long way where the sort of, okay, I'm just going to do this because someone said I have to, that sometimes comes across with a different energy. So that too, what do folks think? It it does. And this is why I mentioned that, you know, find something you're interested in. Um, No matter what the the subject is, you will find it an open data set that you can actually play with and starting, you know, you know, analyzing and, and, okay, I'm going to do an EDA expert data analysis about, you know, global warming, let's say, you know, easiest topic that comes to mind. Um, and then, um, or something that is, is uh, you know, uh, in the news a lot, maybe, you know, wars or something, I don't know. Pick up a topic that interests you, find a, a data set or data sets, start doing an ADA using an open source language. Don't stick to, you know, expensive like SAS and so forth, R or Python or, you know, Ruby or others. Uh, and start publishing your, you know, there's so many ways to publish, you know, on GitHub or Medium. And then maybe, uh, you know, people will start commenting on what you are doing. Uh, take their comments. Maybe at some point it will to transfer itself or manifest itself into maybe a piece of software or even like a, a package. Uh, I've seen this happening a lot. And, um, you know, once you, once you are at that, that level, we're building software package, open software package, like an R or Python. Um, it's that that's pretty much it. You know, you're here on top. That's when people start, you know, hiring you basically. Yeah. And, you know, it was the word I, the word I jotted down as you were talking about this, I have this word for this type of jobs, which are almost inception jobs where you like incept yourself, the job, right? You go out and you actually create the presence and create the value. And then a job emerges different from say a for-profit job, right? If I'm looking for a for-profit data science job, there are a hundred of them available right now, or the type of jobs you're talking about, someone has done something that is a genuine signal of what they're capable of, and jobs come to them. And, and, and keep in mind that, you know, the only thing we talked about so far is really jobs, you know, people trying, leaving academic jobs, you keep keep an open mind about maybe starting your own business or freelancing. Um, that, that's a big thing. Um, you know, everything will be done remotely nowadays, so don't restrict your jobs to your, your you know, you know, uh, uh, way of thinking to only, uh, I want to get a job. Maybe, maybe it doesn't fit you. Maybe uh, you can be a freelancer. Maybe you can establish your own business. Yeah. And all the, the one, one common thing that comes up at where I work is that obviates all of the documentation issues. If you're not document, if you don't have the right document, you know, if you freelance, you, you can write your own ticket, you know, a lot of times without worrying about the, the big powers that be. Well, and so I could personally keep chatting with panelists all day about this, but I have to be sensitive to time since we're at time. So I will start off by thanking our panelists for making time to share their expertise with us. So thank you all for taking this space. And folks in in the attendance, if you want to jot a thank you, if you found anything helpful, that would be awesome. I will also say thanks to attendees, right? You just made an hour thinking about possibilities for your career things that you can do with your doctoral training. And so I'm excited that you're opening those doors for yourself. Panelists, any links or follow-ups you want to share in case folks want to follow up after today's panel? Anything you want to drop into chat? Uh, I'm I'm dropping my uh, Twitter handler. Nice. So in case folks want to stay connected there. I will also offer that if anyone is listening in on today's panel and feeling like you need some structure and guidance on what's next, I have this playbook I developed based on working with 80 folks moving out of academia, which shares some insights and structures for PhDs who want to leave. I'll open up for panel attendees a 30% discount for the first 10 folks to purchase that first come first serve since I know you're here and I know you're interested. So I will just drop that link in the chat in case folks are ready to make that move, but feeling like they need more structure. Anything else panel that we wanna put in as follow-ups? Just wanna thank you for the opportunity to, um, you know, to share the love. 
right? This is I also want to thank you. Yeah, I want to thank you for the opportunity. And I've learned so much from my seniors. I mean, they've been there for a long time. I'm now a toddler taking the first step, but I'm privileged to be on a panel with them. Thanks. Great, great job, Emmanuel. Yeah. Yeah, I would like to uh, thank you all, especially uh, Tori. And uh, if any of uh, you know people uh, want to reach out to me on, on Twitter or email me, uh, uh, questions at church, I'll be more than happy to help. Thank you all. Well, thank you so much. I know I learned a lot from today's panel. I think you folks are experts in your various crafts, and so it's been wonderful to hear from you. And again, my hope is that for attendees, that attendees are walking away with a sense of inspiration and opportunity from what you heard today. So I hope that you each uh, have a great rest of your day and find success in crafting the career that best suits you. Have a great rest of your day, folks. Thank Bye. you. Thank you all. Bye.